So now we think that it is all over. We celebrated this weekend the resurrection and the Passover, and then we closed the book three years. And that is not the story of the Bible. The mysteries of God are mysterious in character, yet they are proclaimed to all who can understand them. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, the first one, you'll read this in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians. He is telling the story that their faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now he speaks of a different wisdom altogether. He said, yes, among the mature, we teach wisdom. It is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, for they are doomed to pass away. He speaks of an entirely different wisdom, which he claims to be the secret, the hidden secret of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glorification. Then he says, For what person knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which dwells in him. So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we are told after the resurrection, those who were closest to him still did not understand him. For when he appeared, they said, Lord, Will you now, at this time, restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times and seasons, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you wait until you receive the power which will come upon you when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That is the power of which I speak, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then, with that power, you will be my witnesses, witnessing in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, but not until it comes upon you. When it comes upon you, you're told the Holy Spirit is one remembrance. He'll bring to your remembrance all the things that I have told you. The whole will come back. And then you will actually reproduce within yourself my story. That's what he's telling you. He now disappears. He has now revealed to them the true exodus. That the exodus of the Old Testament was an adumbration a foreshadowing. Resurrection, followed by the birth from above, is the true exodus from this world of tears, this world of bondage. So the Jews celebrated the exodus and are still in bondage. And the Christians celebrated the resurrection and they haven't yet been resurrected. That whole thing is a drama. When the Spirit comes upon you, which is the Spirit of power, then He will bring to your remembrance all that I have told you, which I have received from my Father. So within the individual upon whom this power comes, which is the Holy Spirit, the whole thing will unfold within Him. They completely misunderstood it, and they thought the restoration of a national theocracy 
was what was intended was the coming of Messiah. They did not realize that the truest coming of Jesus was the manifest power of the Holy Spirit. That when this power comes, it lifts you up from within yourself. And then you actually are the being that the world yesterday celebrated as about his resurrection. You are that one spoken of in scripture. But you will not know it and be a witness to this until the power comes upon you. And that power is the power of the Holy Spirit. And the whole thing unfolds within you. Now, you've heard of the story. You all know the story. Did you ever dwell upon the character called Judas? And today we speak of a man who is a betrayer of a trust. He is a Judas. He simply betrayed the trust, any kind of a trust. A man just died in New York City in prison who betrayed the trust of the Mafia. He was one of the leaders in the Mafia. And he gave to the FBI the true name our thing, Casa Nostra. No one claimed his body. There he was, he died in prison. Because there was a price on his head, a fabulous price to kill him. And so he was protected while he was in prison because he had revealed the secrets of this thing that wormed its way into society called our thing where they made billions if you could not put a finger on it. Therefore, it wasn't taxable. But he betrayed it, so he was a Judas. Well, that is not the Judas of Scripture. But who is this Judas? We are told that at the Last Supper, he said, the one to whom I will give the Supper my time has come. Everything was done on order in the Gospel of John. He never moved. He resisted all action until the right moment. My time has not yet come. Beginning with the second chapter, he said to the brothers in the seventh chapter, my hour has not yet come. And he goes through the entire book stating that the time has not yet come. He is following a divine plan. So here we find predestination in one and we find free will both joined together in man. He teaches man to exercise free will and shows them how to change the pattern of life. But he is under compulsion to fulfill the Father's will. Everything must be done on time. So the moment of betrayal has come. In the oriental custom, two would sit on a divan or couch. The honored guest was always the one to whom the host gave the sock. He would take the sock, dip it in to the dish, and then hand it to the honored guest. So the one to whom I give it, he will be drinking. He turns and he gives it to Judas. And Judas goes out quickly. And he said to him, what you have to do, do quickly. It is perfectly so, I tell you. I know from experience. What you have to do, do quickly. And Judas goes out. Yet they do not understand who it is going to be who will be praying. Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Well, it's obvious the one to whom he gave it. The who then is Judas? He betrays the messianic secret. Now, no one knows the thoughts of God, but the Spirit of God. Is he not then the Spirit of God? If he betrays God, only the Spirit of God could betray God. For no man knows the thoughts 
of a man, but the spirit of man which dwells in him. And no one knows or comprehends the thoughts of God, but the spirit of God. Then is he not the spirit of God? For no one could betray me but the spirit of myself. Only the one that I would call friend and then divulge my secret could betray me. And so he calls him now my friend. It's his own spirit. Now we are told there are two traditions as to his death in scripture. Matthew tells us, the 27th chapter, that he went out and hanged himself. In other words, he committed suicide. Jesus is made to say, no one takes away my life. I lay down myself. I have the power to lay down and the power to take it up again. So here we find the suicide, the parallel. But in the book of Acts, it is said he swelled up. And swelling up, he burst in the middle. Then all of his bowels came gushing out. Now, two entirely different traditions. One given us by Luke, or Luke wrote the book of Acts. And then we have the one in Matthew. Now a friend of mine, and he is here tonight, he said, this happened to me a year ago. I didn't tell it because I didn't know. It seemed so strange to me. But this weekend I was reading the 13th chapter of the book of John. Reading about the Last Supper. Reading all about the song. Reading all these things. And I wondered, what nonsense. This salt where he gave us up. To whom he gave it. Why ask all these questions? Is it I? Is it I? And then one whispered, ask him who it is. The one, the honored guest could not be across the street. The honored guest would be right next to him. The one whose head was on his bosom. And he dipped the up and gave it. And so what you have to do, do quickly. Now we say, a year ago, I had a vision. And in my vision, I saw you dead. You were dead. You were dressed in white radiant white, and your bowels were completely out. That was your death. Not understanding it, I hesitated to mention it, because it struck me at the time that would be Judas. And so I saw you dressed in white, radiant white, and you were dead, and your death was caused by the swelling up and the best in your middle, and out came all of your bowels, gushing out, and there was never any thing. He saw the perfect vision. I tell you, when it happens, everything in you, all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within. In your own wonderful human imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. So all these characters are within himself. And the nearest to him is the spirit of himself, which is Judas. The word Judas is the same as Judah, the one mentioned in the genealogy. So when it comes to, and speaking of the genealogy, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brother. He didn't mention the first three brothers, if they could have mentioned the first three, he jumps over the three and goes to the fourth one. Judah. Judah means the hand, but it's the hand of God, the power of God. It's the creative power of God, the directive power of God that can fulfill his purpose. And his purpose is to give himself to man. The story of Jesus is the biography of God. That's God. Now when that unfolds itself in man, God has succeeded in giving himself to man. That man then tells it. So today here we single out an individual as though this thing happened on earth. 
It didn't happen on earth. This is God's plan. It's all written in scripture. When it happens in you, you read scripture to find the parallel. But the whole thing is taking place in a supernatural world. All within you. He speaks to man through the medium of dreams. But he reveals himself in vision. It is God unveiling himself. So one who comes into my world, and no one comes unless the Father within me calls him, he has a vision. He hesitated for quite a while to tell me because of the tradition concerning Judas. For he was the one whose bowel, as he swelled up, he burst in the middle, and all of his bowels gushed out. He was the one who betrayed the secret, as I betrayed every time I take this platform. I am telling you the secret of God every time I take this platform. I am playing the part of Judas every Monday and Friday night. I have played every time I talk to a friend. When they call me on the phone, I am betraying the secret. I have come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So I tell you the law. I reinterpret the law psychologically and tell you that an assumption or false, if persisted in, will harden into fact. Two thousand years ago, you heard that same statement told in this manner. Whatever you desire, believe that you have received it and you will. It's the identical thing told in a more modern form. Same thing. If you dare to assume this, that, or the other and persist in your assumption, it will harden into fact and project itself on the screen of space. That is the law. It's psychological. Now the prophets, they're predicted the sufferings of the coming one. I'm told of the glory that would be his. He first, he was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Well, you can't take these five terms and come to any other conclusion than predestination. That is the spirit in man fulfilling the will of God, leading that man up to God himself. For the story of the gospel is God's biography. When that story unfolds itself in the individual, in the first person, singular, and present tense experience, he is now it's his biography. And if it's God's biography, and it is his experience, then who is it? He is that power. When that power comes upon him, he is power. And who is the power of God? Jesus Christ. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. When someone now puts his or her hand to the plow and turning back, he unfits himself for the kingdom of heaven. But the one who called him will not allow him or allow her to unfit himself or herself for that kingdom. And so if he appears to her or to him, as sheer power, it is for a purpose. As we are told, if one will not believe, having been called and having been spoken to, as told us in the story of Gabriel, and Gabriel came into the presence of Zechariah and told Zechariah that the Lord had sent him, and then told Zechariah of the coming of the birth of John. And he said, how will I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. That is, wherever the messenger is sent, God is with him. For the sender and the sender one. 
And the word Gabriel means either the power of God or the man of God. You can translate it in either way. So now you want a sign. But this shall be your sign. You shall be silent and unable to speak until that day when this thing is fulfilled. And when he came out of the temple, he could not speak. And those who waited on the outside in prayer while he lit the incense on the inside were dumbfounded because they knew something had happened when they saw him. He couldn't speak. He was dumb. And then when the child was born, and then on the eighth day, which was the day now to be circumcised, they wanted to know what to name the child. And they thought, certainly Zachariah, after his father. And he made signs, for he could not speak, to bring him a tablet that he could write. And he wrote on the tablet, his name is John. And as he wrote, his name is John. And the whole thing was fulfilled, his mouth opened, his tongue was loose, and then he spoke. That was sheer power. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. But in this world of ours, when I am put into the place of playing such a part, in his infinite mercy, he takes from my conscious reasoning mind that individual act that I am not left with it. That I will play in the depths of my own being. I will play anything that my father, who is one with myself, commands me to play. That they who would now stray from the path will be brought back into it. If that little thing was only for one moment, that you are down, unable to speak. And here, for one moment, there was no speech. But I tell you, this play is the eternal play. It didn't close yesterday when the bowl overflowed and all of a sudden they came out. When they reinterpreted the entire story and called it positive thinking or positive decision and all this nonsense. This is the eternal story. Wait until you receive power from on high. For the power will come and you will be overcome with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, He will bring to your remembrance all that I have told you. And what have I told you? My life. I have told you exactly what happened to me supernaturally. That will then happen to you individually. And you will know that I told you the truth. That is the eternal story of the gospel. So when he said, among the mature, I too impart a wisdom. It is not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, for they are doomed to pass away. I impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glorification. That's what he imparted. Then he tells us in that same chapter, the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, how it's impossible for any person to know a man's thoughts except the spirit of that man which dwells in him. And therefore, no one knows or comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. And so he sent the Spirit upon him. So the real coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus, in the truest sense, is simply the manifested power of the Holy Spirit. That's his coming. He can't come in any other way. He becomes invisible. He departs this world. And then sends the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit comes like the wind. I tell you, just like the wind. And when you hear it, it's the most unearthly sound you have ever heard. But its wind is like a storm wind. It possesses you. 
and then you wake. And you wake to find yourself in tune, and then you come out of that tomb where you've been buried. And then everything, the entire story now, unfolds within you. Scene after scene without any deviation. And that's the being that you are. And when it happens and it comes to the very end, you know who you are. You are God himself. You are the power of God, for that is Jesus Christ. The power of God and the wisdom of God. And now you know the true exodus from bondage. That what you read about in the Old Testament was only an adumbration, a foreshadowing. But when it happens to you, this is the true exodus. When you are set free. Set free because you found the Son. And if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And the Son stands before you. And you know exactly who he is. And he knows who you are. So don't close the book and wait for a year. Set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you as the unveiling and the revelation of Christ in you. For that's where he is. He's all buried within you. In the meanwhile, use the law psychologically. External observation means nothing. All the outside ceremonies mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's all just, well, that was my command when I was saying, done with the blue blood. All church protocol. That's what it means. Done with it completely. Pay no attention to it. Even to the little simple thing, which is a very pleasant thing, and you sit down to dine, and someone calls upon you to say grace, say grace. Don't be abusive about it, say. But you know it means nothing. But do it if you're called upon to do it. We do not have it at home. We sit down and I thoroughly enjoy my meal that my wife prepared. And I thank her for preparing it. But if one calls upon you to do it, do it. But all outside ceremony means absolutely nothing. That was my command when I was sent. Down with the blue blood. Down with all church protocol. So the so-called kissing of the feet, as you saw this picture the other day, and the washing of the feet of these twelve elderly men, and kissing of the feet, that's out. Has nothing to do with real, real Christianity. I tell you what it is, from experience. He will wake within you, and then you will know every one of those disciples, what aspect of your own being you represent. And that one who was closest to him, the one who was his friend, the one to whom he gave the honored peace, that was Judas, the hand of God, the directive hand that could fulfill his purpose in by betraying the secret. As I do every time I talk to you, I betray the secret of Christ. I can't betray it if I don't know it. No one can betray what he doesn't know. And so one must first know it to betray it. Well, I'm betraying it. I'm telling you exactly how it happens. It happens in the way that I have told you. It will come suddenly upon you, the Holy Spirit. It will come like a storm wind. And when it comes, you will awake. To find yourself in tune. And then you will have the innate wisdom, for Christ is also the wisdom of God, not only the power of God. To move that stone where it was, that was the seal, break it by pushing it from within. And you will come out. And you will find surrounding you, the witnesses to the great event that God succeeded in his purpose, which was awakening you as God. For this is the birth of God, not born of blood or the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And you come out. And the sign of your birth is present. And here is the sign wrapped, as you're told, in swaddling clothes. And you pick it up, and in the most endearing manner, you say, how is my sweetheart? And the whole thing vanishes, including the three witnesses who witnessed the birth. 
Then comes the second great event when he stands before you and you fulfill scripture, the 89th Psalm. I have found David. He cried unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And there he stands before you. And this relationship is forever. It's a returning memory. For you do not have the feeling that it happens now. It's simply that your memory has returned. Just as though you had suffered from total amnesia. It's not something that's part of you, you have always known about your son. That's the feeling that I had. So all of a sudden he comes back. What comes back? Well, the Holy Spirit is on me. Well, who is the Holy Spirit? He who brings to your remembrance all that I have told you. And did not David in the Spirit call me my Lord? Well, when he calls you my Lord, which is the name of my father, for all sons call their father and spoke of their father as my Lord. So David in the spirit called me my Lord. He does it in spirit, not here on earth. And then comes the grand servants of your body from top to bottom. And you're ascent into heaven, separating the event called resurrection from the ascension. And you can count them. It's not any 40 days. You can count the whole thing up. It's between, mine was on the 20th of July of 59, and the ascent took place on the 8th day of April of 1960. And that's when one ascends, ascends into heaven. And the whole thing, as you're told, reverberates like thunder. And then comes the seal of approval on the 1260th day. And that is the saint of the Holy Spirit in bodily form as a dove. And here he rests upon you, you bring him, and he is mounting you with kisses when the whole thing fades. And then you come and you tell him. And so the story of Judas, when he does betray, he does it quickly. May I tell you, you are seated on the floor explaining the word of God to those who are seated before you, and he is one of them. And suddenly, he jumps, and you know exactly what he's going to do. He is going to tell, you don't use the word betray, he is going to tell exactly what he heard you say, for you are speaking of the kingdom of God. And he's going to tell that you're speaking of the kingdom and that you are the king. And he's going to tell the authorities concerning what you said. He has to betray the king. And he goes up and he tells it. Then comes the authority in and he unveils your arm. And his name who went out is the arm of God, the hand of God. He unveils it, and you see the relationship between the one who went out and yourself. Now you are completely unveiled. When he nails into your shoulder that peg, that wooden peg, and hammers it in, and then takes off the sleeve and puts the arm and it's bare. And then you know the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Who has believed our report? And to whom? has the arm of the Lord been revealed. And if everything is placed upon that knee, he has then to bear the burden, but he will see the travail of his efforts, of his labor, and he will rejoice. He'll be satisfied. When he knows that he got through, so you can say to anyone, if there's seeming in any role that seems a harsh role, then, no, I consciously am not aware of it. While I play that part, I have to play. For this is a supernatural world of which I speak. It's a supernatural being of which I speak. It's a supernatural part that I'm playing when I play those parts at night. And certain parts, I am relieved of the memory of them. Or they have to be done. 
to jack one up, having put his hand to the plow and turning back, unfits himself for the kingdom of heaven. And what caused him to turn back? Doubt. Big question. And so when Zechariah said, how will I know this? I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. How can she conceive and bear a son? He said, I stand in the presence of God. In other words, I am speaking for the one who sent me, and he never left me. Therefore, he stands with me. Now, sheer power is going to make you dumb. And so he said to her, to him, you will be silent, unable to speak, until that which I have foretold has come to pass, because you did not believe the words that he who gave me to speak, and I spoke to him, you did not believe my words. So you'll see me in many roles. Many of you see me in different roles. Yet, my conscious reasoning mind has always been removed on my return from certain parts that I had to play. For I am under compulsion to play those parts after being awakened. And my friend had to see me in that role to know who Judas really is. And I am Judas. Every time I betray the messianic secret. And I am the one who told him to do it quickly. That scene I recall vivid. What you have to do, do quickly. He certainly did it quickly. There was no time between his departure and the arrival of the authority who came in and severed my sleep and hammered into my shoulder that wooden thing on which he then placed the burden. So I tell you, this play is an eternal play. It goes on forever and forever and forever. And each one makes his exit, which is the exodus, from this world of tears into a blissful state. But only in that way does he ever make the exodus. So when they sing the hymns of how they were led out of bondage in Egypt, into a world of freedom, and yet all are still as enslaved as they were thousands of years ago, then what are they commemorating? So when the real leader, the new Moses come, they would not recognize him. A new Moses came, he was called Jesus, which means Jehovah. God himself came this time in the form of man. That's the new Moses. And his life is the pattern that man will one day imitate, actually experience. And therefore it's his pattern. It is his. And it's the only way you will ever make an exit from this world. Death will not take you out of this world. You will die and you'll be restored to life. Just as you are now, in a world just like this. It's terrestrial. And you will still be making your effort as you do it right now. No transforming power whatsoever in the thing called death. There is no transformation in death. Find yourself the same thing. Young, yes. But that's not transformation. The same identity. But that of which I speak is a complete transfiguration. A complete transformation of form. You're no longer this little garment. You are glorified, and you wear a glorified body that doesn't have the needs of this body at all. And wherever you go clothed in that body, everything is perfect. There's no place you could go. Walk through hell, it will become heaven. And someone clothed in these garments, walking through heaven, will turn it into hell. So I tell you, you are in for the most glorious thing in the world. And what I have told you, I tell you from my own personal experience. 
I am not theorizing. I am not speculating. I knew that someone had to see me in that road. And he had this vision a year ago. But because of custom and his association with the idea of Judas as the one whose bowels, first of all, he swelled up and swelling up, he burst in the middle and all of his bowels came gushing out. And loving me as he does and believing me as he does, he didn't know how to associate that with the one that he so loved and trust to tell the truth. But I can tell you, they are the same being, for he is the spirit of the one. The honored guest to whom he gave the son. That is the honored position, not around the table, as we have it here in Da Vinci's picture. There was no table. Not in the oriental world, you sat on a divan, not more than two at any one moment. And divans were around. And the host, if he ever dipped it, he could take a piece of meat and dip it. And the one to whom he gave the meat, or a piece of bread, that was the sop. The one to whom he gave it, that was the honored guest. As we today sitting around the table, we sit the honored guest to our right. And here we, that's the honored position. And there, the one whose head was on his breast. And he just simply moves it. Who is nearest to you but your spirit? So that no one knows or comprehends the thoughts of God but the spirit of God. If God was ever betrayed, it could only be betrayed by the spirit of God. It had to be revealed. It could not be discovered by any philosophical reason. No man in this world, as you're told in scripture, man could not find God. All the wisdom of man could not find God. God had to reveal himself. And the revealing is the betrayal of God. He betrays himself by unveiling himself to man. And this is a story as it's written and told us in Scripture. You set your hope fully upon that moment in time when it comes to you. It's called grace. Set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. For grace is simply an unearned, unmerited gift of God to man. And that gift is God himself. So you are raised from the level of being a son to the level of being the father. Now let us go into the silence. in the scripture would be Jesus. He said, no man takes away my life. I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. So if no man ever took his life on, how can we blame anyone or any race of people for his death? <clears throat> it's stated so clearly in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. No man in fact, the three earliest manuscripts uses the sense, no man take, has taken away. As though he's not speaking on this level at all. No man has taken my life. And scholars can quite understand how these three earliest and oldest manuscripts could have it written in that manner. That's exactly what it should be said. Because the drama isn't taking place here at all. Well, if he took his own life, then he's a suicide, isn't he? Well, then you're told in Matthew to make it perfectly clear 
that he went out and hanged himself, meaning Judas. Well, the word Judas is taken from, the root of the word is Yod, the first letter in the name of God, Yod-Heh-Vav-Heh.